right here on 910 a.m the superstation the future radio hey i'm your host brother michael m hotel it is friday february 26th 2021 and we are live hope everybody's doing well today it's been a very very busy day closing out a busy week i was um a panelist on roland martin unfiltered today we did uh about two hours and 15 minutes. So we had a very good show uh, today and I'm gonna share an excerpt of it uh, with you because in the first segment, we talked about um, the fight for 15 and the Senate parliamentarian uh, who is the referee of the Senate ruling uh, on Thursday that Democrats could not include a $15 an hour federal minimum wage uh, in the clause in the $1.9 trillion uh, coronavirus, coronavirus bill. They cannot include that in the bill as part of the budget, uh, the budget reconciliation. So the fight continues uh, for the fight for 15. So we know we talked about this on today's show and we talked about it on Roland Martin filtered today as well. So uh, the House is set to vote on uh, Joe Biden's $1.9 trillion COVID uh, rescue plan. It's expected to pass the House and uh, it's expected to have more of a fight in the Senate. So we'll discuss that. Uh, also, there was a, a article that I uh, posted about, uh, came out, actually came out Thursday, February 25th. And it's an article dealing with the Cherokee Nation and uh, the black freedmen, the black freedmen, the um, uh, African-Americans who are descendants of the um, African-Americans that the Cherokee Nation owned as slaves. Cherokee Nation strikes down language that limits citizenship rights by blood. Cherokee Nation strikes down language that limits citizenship rights by blood. And uh, this is something uh, big. This is something that just happened with the Cherokee Nation. And we know that uh, you've heard me talk about before how the uh, Choctaw, Chickasaw Creek, Cherokee, and, and Seminole Indians all owned uh, African slaves. So we're gonna talk some about that history and then also when we, when we deal with the Creek Indians, that ties into the history of um, Tulsa, Oklahoma and Black Wall Street. So uh, uh, we'll discuss that. Then there was a uh, article. I, I was going to talk about it on a Thursday show, but we had such a jam packed show Thursday. I said I would save it to Friday. And I've been dealing with these stories, dealing with how. Republican dominated state legislatures are trying to change the uh, they're passing new laws to restrict what teachers can teach regarding slavery and oppression and injustice, things like this. So there was an article from Axios uh, dot com from February 24th. States wrestle with how to teach slavery genocide states wrestle with how to teach slavery genocide and they talk about the attack on the 1619 project and the push to uh use the debunked 1776 project etc okay so we'll discuss that as well once again this is dealing with history in the headlines and this is dealing with this fight over how to teach the history of slavery whether or not to teach it what's going to be taught in school regarding history, et cetera, okay? And what people understand about history influences the policies that they support. It influences who they support in office, which politicians they vote for, which policies they support, et cetera, okay? What they know, what a particular group of people know about another group of people is based upon what they, uh, read, seen, and heard about the people. How have they been educated? Have they been taught the history in school of another group of people, another race of people? 
are they operating mainly based upon lies and and mischaracterizations and stereotypes? So uh, we'll discuss that. And then also uh, states wrestle with uh, how to teach uh, slavery genocide. OK, so we'll talk about that and more um, today on the African History Network show. Uh, there, there was also an article from. Uh, there was an article from uh, Huffington Post that you, so you see uh, many Republicans coming out against the fight to raise the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour from $7.25 an hour. A lot of these Republicans are in Southern states, former Confederate states. And raising the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour would benefit a lot of poor white Republicans who actually voted for these people. So I, I, I talked about it yesterday on the show, how I didn't understand this. And somebody else who doesn't understand it is uh, W. Craig Jel uh, Jel uh, Jelinek, J-E-L-I-N-E-K, J-E-L-I-N-E-K, W. Craig Jelinek. Now, uh, Jelinek is the CEO of Costco. Costco has announced that, the you know, the warehouse uh, uh, membership club uh, company, Costco has announced that they're going to raise their minimum wage to $16 an hour starting next week. And Costco CEO W. Craig Jelinek can't understand why Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina is against raising the federal minimum wage that has not been raised in 12 years. And once again, as I said on yesterday's show, when it was raised 12 years ago, it was Democrats that raised it, raised it to seven dollars and twenty five cents an hour from something like five dollars and twenty five cents an hour, five dollars and fifty cents an hour. And many of these Republican senators. Who are against raising the federal minimum wage. Represent some of the poorest states in the country. Like South Carolina, Alabama, Kentucky. And uh, uh, Lindsey Graham is from South Carolina. South Carolina just also happens to be the state that the Civil War started in. Maybe there's a correlation there. I wouldn't be surprised if there is. So we'll, we'll talk about that on today's show. All right. Uh, you can still register for the online course that I teach, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa understand the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. This is a eight-week, 16-hour online course that I teach. We deal with thousands of years of history, and we deal with what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. It meets on uh, Tuesdays, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We do the sessions live. You can go back and watch it over and over again. Uh, as soon as you register, you can watch the class from this past Tuesday. When my guest was uh, my uh, my guest speaker in the class was Dr. David M. Hotel, um, author of the book "The First Americans Were Africans: Documented Evidence." We had a really good class. We dealt with some ancient African history. We dealt with uh, the African presence in the Americas going back tens of thousands of years in this land go that we call the United States of America, going back at least fifty one thousand seven hundred years ago. So. Uh, I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, video clips. It's about 50 articles that I reference. Uh, so as soon as you register, you can uh, start watching uh, last week's class and bonus content. Uh, the class is regularly $130. It's on sale $80. So uh, we just posted the link here. Or you can go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and register for the class. Okay. All right, now, on the uh, African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now, it's correct your own behavior, what you, what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when we control the radius of a man's thoughts or a woman's thoughts, you can control the comforts of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. 
Now, we deal with a number of different topics here on the African History Network show. We deal with current events in history, politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828. Sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828. Sign up for our email newsletter. Also visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, we have, um, for the last few days of uh, African American History Month, we have a uh, 20% off sale. Get 20% off uh, orders of uh, $100 or more at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. So we have the information right on the home page. Use promo code AHN20OFF, 20AHN20OFF2021. Uh, so you can use this on uh, you know, my DVD lectures, uh, digital downloads, um, bundle packs, things like that. OK, so we have the information at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. OK, Sharon asked about a book list. She said, great class. Uh, Sharon was in class uh, this past Tuesday. I'll have a book list um, uh, for ne uh, next Tuesday's class. I'll have a book list, but we also have a recommended reading list of books at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. It's recommended reading list of about 70 books. But uh, for the class, I think it's about maybe seven that I, that I really use. So we'll have a, a list of books uh, coming this Tuesday, okay? And if you have any questions about the class, also you can uh, e uh, email us at ahnshow at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, ahnshow at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. All right, uh, if you want to support the African History Network, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show or at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Okay, so um, on yesterday's show, we're coming up here on the break. Uh, you know, we talked about how the uh, Senate parliamentarian ruled that Democrats can't put $15 uh, minimum wage in COVID relief bill. All right. So we see that um, Nancy Pelosi spoke out on this. She she, uh, she totally disagrees with the basically disagrees with the parliamentarian. Um, but Senate Democrats are looking at using the budget reconciliation process to pass their version of the one point nine trillion dollar package without Republican support by simple majority. Uh, the House is expected to pass the one point nine trillion dollar COVID relief package proposed by uh, Joe Biden. Uh, and they were dealt a, a blow Thursday night uh, when the Senate parliament, parliamentarian, essentially the chamber's referee, ruled that Democrats cannot include a $15 per hour federal federal minimum wage in this $1.9 trillion package. Uh, Speaker Nancy Pelosi called the ruling disappointing and vowed that the House uh, of Representatives version of the bill will still include the wage increase, the $15 an hour uh, minimum wage. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer also said he was disappointed in the decision and added that Democrats are, quote, not going to give up the fight to raise the min minimum wage, end quote. We'll discuss this on the other side of the break. Listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the Future Radio, Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. For 25 years, the Black History 101 Mobile Museum has carried on the rich legacy of the Black Museum movement in America by showcasing original artifacts of the Black experience at colleges, universities, K-12 schools, corporations, libraries, conferences, and cultural events, making it the most traversed Black History Mobile exhibit in American history. Dr. Khalid El Hakim is the founder of the Black History One on One Mobile Museum, and he is a highly sought after public speaker on topics of black history, social studies, education, museum studies, hip hop and race relations. Dr. Khalid was named among the change makers for NBC Universal's Erase Hate campaign and listed as one of the 100 men of distinction for black enterprise. He recently founded the Michigan Hip Hop Archive on the campus of Western Michigan University. The Black History One on One Mobile Museum is currently scheduling in-person and virtual exhibits nationwide. 
For more information, please contact Dr. Lid Al Hakim directly at 313-645-4197, 313-645-4197, or visit their website at blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. That's blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. You can also email him at bhistory101 at yahoo.com, bhistory101 at yahoo.com. Are you getting ready for fall or winter? We have the solution for all seasonal clothing needs. Cometicwear.com is the go-to online source for Cometic African fashion and lifestyle products with a contemporary twist. We're committed to offering unique styles reflecting our African heritage. Cometicwear.com is inspired by Cometicscribes.com to influence our people in learning and showing pride. Please visit our website at Cometicwear.com. Hi, I'm Joel Wilson, President and CEO of JCW Computer Consulting LLC, a technology implementation firm with over 20 years of satisfying customers. We offer a full spectrum of industry top tier branded services. We are an authorized partner or reseller for Lenovo, Zoom, T-Mobile, Microsoft 365 and Surface tablets, Google Workspace, Acer, Asus, Samsung, PCmatic security software, and many more. Our online store features laptops, Chromebooks, computers, printers, accessories, and software. Businesses, Take advantage of our free one-hour Zoom tech consultation and know we offer top nationwide high-speed internet service providers, voice over IP, and cellular phone services. Home users, don't miss our current in-stock Chromebook inventory. Please visit us at jcwcc.com or call 215-879-6701. Digital Dandelion's technical solutions works with businesses like yours to create an operations manual for your business, which is something many businesses don't have. According to AARP, more than 30% of small business owners are over 50 years old. Many business owners want to retire by selling their businesses or by passing their businesses on to their children. However, According to Forbes Investment Advisors, many retiring owners attempts to sell their businesses or retire fail. Cannot sell your business without a business manual. Your children also cannot inherit your business because there is no way to run it. Your business does not have to die when you leave. Their business Bible products will give you the tools you need for a thriving business that can make you money even after you retire. Are you looking at increasing your business's annual revenue? Digital Dandelions can help you make at least $100,000 in annual revenue and expand your business. Speak with them today about solidifying your business. Visit digitaldandelions.com today and get a free 30-minute consultation. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM Superstation Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Friday, February 26, 2021, and we're live. Uh, call in numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment. All right, and remember, we're here Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to 12 midnight Eastern Standard Time, and Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay, so uh, I want to go to uh, this first story here. So we were talking about, uh, like on Thursday show, we were talking about the uh, fight for a $15 uh, federal minimum wage. And we see that uh, there was a, uh, there's an article here from uh, February 26 from uh, NBC News dealing with the uh, $1.9 trillion, $1. $1. $1 trillion COVID relief bill. 
House of Representatives to vote on Biden's $1.9 trillion COVID relief bill with $1,400 checks. Uh, and we talked about all of this on Roland Martin Unfiltered uh, today. So I, I want to go uh, to this clip. We're going to go to clip one, uh, Shakita. Accomplished when you have power. End of story. Um, Michael, again, uh, I, and I, I made the point yesterday, and I, I saw some folks they were they were commenting on this uh, on, on the segment that we did where I where I said Democrats, um, if you don't pass these things, <laughs> you're asking to get your butts kicked in 2022. You, you can't go out and make an argument to people uh, if you want to if you want to replace. If you want a Democrat to replace Rob Portman, if you want a Democrat to replace Richard Burr, if you want a Democrat uh, to replace uh, uh, Ron Johnson in Wisconsin, if you want a Democrat to replace uh, Pat Toomey in Pennsylvania. I mean, the, the reality is Democrats have an opportunity to expand their majority. You're not going to be able to go out and convince people, hey, if you all come out and vote and do all you can to put us in power, we're going to do what's right. Not when you had the shot. Right. You, you, you know, when you have power, you have to wield the power because you don't know how long you're going to have it. But the, you know, I talked about this last night on my show, Roland. Um, there is an element that there's a tool that I don't I haven't heard anybody mention yet, period, in any of these discussions. That tool is economic withdrawal, targeting certain corporations that back some of these Republicans who are standing in the way and speaking out against the $15 an hour. And what I mean by that is that, you know, you know this, Roland, FEC.gov, Federal Elections Commission, it lists the corporations that donate to people who run for federal office, U.S. House of Representatives, U.S. Senate, and President. We need to really look at, because see, as Dr. Greg Carr said yesterday on your show, there are no rules. There are no rules, okay? So we really have to take a page from uh, Dr. King, April 3rd, 1968, I've been to the mountaintop. He said we have to always anchor our external direct action with the power of economic withdrawal. If you look at what the CEO of Costco said today, they're raising their minimum wage to $16 an hour, and he said he can't see why uh, $15 an hour, I should say, raising their minimum wage to $15 an hour, and he said he can't see No, Costco's why. going to 16 Yeah, Costco's uh, going to 16 That's what I thought. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. He said he can't see why Senator Lindsey Graham has a problem with raising the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour. It hasn't been raised in 12 years. So we really need to look at, put it four, four five, six key corporations that help to back some of these Republicans financially. We need to really look at putting economic pressure on them and then the uh, companies like Costco who support the measure, you know, have them really speak out as well. because. The last time the federal minimum wage was raised was 12 years ago, and that was raised by Democrats, and it was raised to $7.25 an hour. And this will, will lift millions of Americans out of poverty, especially millions of African Americans. So there are no rules. You have to use the power while you have it. Um, absolutely. And, okay. and for folks to understand, when we talk about... Okay, let, 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 let it play for a little bit. Let it play for a couple of minutes. Uh, what they have been doing, folks, uh, is, I mean, they are absolutely targeting the issue of voter suppression. They are passing uh, and, and introducing bills at a, a furious pace uh, that, that in just in many ways is going to greatly change uh, what happened in that state. Why? Because they're angry All right. that black folks pause, voted. Pause, it, pause, pause, pause it right there, Shakita. Pause right there, thanks. We'll, we'll talk about that story uh, Sunday. Th that deals with in Georgia and the bills in the state legislature in Georgia that Republicans are pushing, trying to pass that will restrict voting rights, that will restrict who gets to participate in mail-in voting, how many uh, days you have for early voting, things like this. W Republicans in Georgia are furious that Joe Biden won the state of Georgia, furious that they lost, that Republicans lost two Senate seats. And instead of coming with better policies, because we've talked about this before, instead of coming with better policies, instead of coming to African-Americans, saying, hey, these, this is how our policies are going to help your people. You should vote for us instead of Democrats. What they're trying to do is make it harder for African-Americans to vote and not talk about policies. 
they, they, they're trying to pass laws to make it harder for African Americans to vote. And um, January 30th, the article from the Guardian.com uh, talked about how there are 130 uh, bills in state legislatures. Uh, I'm sorry, 106 bills in state legislatures uh, dominated by Republicans to try to make it harder to vote. Okay. Uh, well, that was January 3rd. Now there are 253 bills in state legislatures, okay, uh, that Republicans are pushing, trying to make it harder to vote. Now, there's something like at the time there was 106 bills, there was about uh, 400 bills being pushed largely by Democrats to make it easier to vote. But you have Republicans, once again, who are not trying to appeal based upon their policies. They're trying to win elections by making it harder to vote and restrict who gets to vote. OK, so read this article here from The Guardian dot com in 2021 legislative sessions. Lawmakers in 28 states have pushed a whopping 106 bills that will restrict voting access. 106 bills that will restrict voting access. Now it's 253 bills. OK, so. Uh, we, so we have the, the fight for 15 con continuing, and uh, Democrats are trying to figure out how to get this bill passed. You don't have 60 votes in the Senate to support $15 an hour. You should, because a lot of these Republicans that support poor states, you would think they would vote for that. We're going to go to uh, uh, All In from MSNBC, Cori Bush, in just a second, Shakita. Uh, but the House of Representatives is set. Uh, has has set up a vote on uh, President Joe Biden's one point nine trillion dollar COVID relief bill for Friday. So it's expected to vote. It's expected to pass just days after the U.S. crossed five hundred thousand deaths from the coronavirus. Now, the Democratic controlled House of Representatives is, is expected to pass the bill uh, uh, to pass the bill overwhelmingly, which includes fourteen hundred direct uh, fourteen hundred dollar direct payments. A, a $400 a week federal uh, a $400 a week federal unemployment bonus, a per child uh, allowance of up to $3,600 for one year and billions of dollars to distribute the coronavirus vaccines and to assist schools and local governments. So once again, when we see the allocation how money is allocated in this bill. What we're seeing is how politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, the adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. Okay, this is this is what we're dealing with. When we get to the uh, story about the Cherokee Nation uh, striking down language that limits citizenship rights by blood, OK, once again, this also ties into uh, treaties as well. OK, so uh, I I'm sending this. Uh, I'm sending this clip to you now, uh, Shakita. OK, let's continue here. So. Uh, just one second, let me flip back over. All right. Now, it would be the sixth round of uh, federal aid. Uh, uh, this bill, this one point nine trillion dollar bill will be the sixth round of federal aid. The economy is still reeling from widespread shutdowns. You still have about 18 million people getting some type of pandemic unemployment assistance. And most Americans continue to wait their turns to be vaccinated. Now, after the sun set on the U.S. Capitol, a House panel voted to reject a slew of Republican amendments and send the bill to the floor, setting up a midnight vote. Uh, Speaker Nancy Pelosi uh, promised that, quote, it will be passed in the House, end quote, adding that she wants it to become law by March 14, 2021, when jobless benefits expire. The current, current jobless benefits expire March 14, 2021 which is just basically two weeks from now. She said, the sooner we pass the bill and it is signed, the sooner we can make the progress that this legislation is all about, saving the lives and the livelihood of the American people, she told reporters. Now, the legislation faces widespread opposition 
from congressional Republicans. OK, and, and you, you, you have to ask the question of why this will help a lot of the poor people that keep voting for your dumb asses that, that we still can't figure out why they're doing it. Well, well, part of it deals with white supremacy and racism. OK, and uh, um, a lot of them. Uh, want to keep uh, resources away from African-Americans. So they, you know, they, they'll um, a, a lot of them are focused on keeping resources away from African-Americans and trying to just hold on to what they have. OK. Um, and. But off, but what happens is they don't realize that a lot of the policies that are good for African-Americans are also good for them as well. Now, the legislation faces widespread opposition from congressional Republicans who decry it as a liberal wish list, a liberal wish list. OK. What was that one point four trillion dollar tax cut that you gave millionaires and billionaires? Now, recent polls show that the package is popular with most Americans earning 66 percent support in an in an economist YouGov study and 76 percent support in a morning consult, uh, po a political survey. House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy, who a Republican from California who has no spine, has no backbone, um, attacked it Friday as a, quote, costly, corrupt and liberal COVID package, end quote, on Twitter. But you side, but you're citing you're supporting Donald Trump and you went down to Mar-a-Lago to kiss Donald Trump's ring. And I don't know what else you kissed while you were down there. But you you're siding with a guy who incited the insurrection to overthrow the government. And you want to talk about corruption. This is these are the type of people we're dealing with. These are the type of amoral, amoral people we're dealing with. OK, I, I call Donald Trump Lucifer in the flesh. These are Lucifer's helpers. These are Lucifer's helpers. No, no morals, no spine, no backbone, just rotten, corrupt to the core. It is not clear whether any Republicans will back it and GOP leaders are pressuring their members to vote no. But the narrow Democratic majority in the House of Representatives can pass it on a party line vote if it largely sticks together. OK, now the fourteen hundred dollar payments would uh, be sent to individuals who make up uh, who make up to seventy five thousand dollars a year or married couples making one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. And they would gradually decrease for those who make more zero zeroing out at a uh, hundred thousand dollars for individuals and two hundred thousand dollars for couples. Now, the House bill also includes a federal minimum wage uh, hike from seven dollars and twenty five cents an hour to fifteen dollars an hour phased in over four years. It increased by uh, one dollar each year up until the year twenty twenty five. Um, so we read about that uh, to yeah, fifteen dollars an hour uh, increased by one dollar each year. OK, so uh, check out this article here from. Uh, NBC News House to vote on Biden's one point nine trillion dollar COVID relief bill with fourteen hundred dollar checks. OK, this is from uh, February 26, 2021. Now, this ties directly into policy, economics, uh, lifting people up out of poverty and raising the federal minimum wage to fifteen dollars an hour. And we see Costco is is uh, raising uh, their minimum wage to sixteen dollars an hour. The CEO of Costco just can't understand um, uh, Lindsey Graham, little, little spineless Lindsey Graham. OK, if we look at this article here quickly, then we're going to go to this clip from uh, MSNBC, Shakita. Uh, if we look at this clip here, uh, Costco CEO doesn't understand what's wrong with Lindsey Graham. A lot of us don't understand what's wrong with Lindsey Graham. Costco CEO doesn't get Lindsey Graham's problem with a $15 an hour minimum wage. Now, one, one of the problems is that uh, a lot of these Republicans are totally out of touch with like everyday common people. Many of them are millionaires. They make at least $170,000 a year. They don't know what it's like to try to survive on $8 an hour, $9 an hour, $10 an hour. They just just totally shut off from reality. Senator Lindsey Graham on Thursday found himself to the right even of the chief executive of a major corporation as the two debated a $15 an hour minimum wage. Costco CEO W. Craig Jelinek could not quite get why 
Lindsey Graham was arguing about the high wage, perhaps because Costco is preparing to up its own minimum wage to $16 an hour starting next week. The company, which employs 180,000 people, Costco employs 180,000 people paid $15 an hour back in 2019, and more than half of the workers are now earning $25 an hour. Wow. I think there's going to be a lot of people applying to Costco. Now, the increase, quote unquote, isn't altruism. Costco CEO W. Craig Jelinek said at a, hear at a hearing of the Senate Budget Committee, quote, at Costco, we know that paying employees good wages makes sense for our business and constitutes a significant competitive advantage for us. It helps us in the long run by minimizing turnover and maximizing employee productivity. He went on to say, we're certainly not perfect, but we try to take care of our employees because they play such a significant role in our success. But spineless, spineless Lindsey Graham, one of Donald Trump's golf buddies, who defended Donald Trump, wanted to hurry up and get the uh, uh, second Senate trial over uh, impeachment trial and just acquit Trump. Spineless Lindsey Graham tried to tell CEO uh, W. Craig Jelinek of Costco that now is not the time to institute a higher minimum wage because of the COVID-19 pandemic. The, now, let's just, let's just hold it. We're going to go to the clip in a minute. Shaquille, I know you got your finger on the button, but just just hold just a second here now. You, um, we just reached 500,000 people dead because of coronavirus. Some of the same spineless, amoral Republicans who refused to impeach Trump and remove him from office in February of 2020 during the first impeachment trial. Now I want to say, because of coronavirus, we shouldn't raise the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour. If you had have done your job in February 2020 and lived up to your oath to defend the Constitution against enemies, both foreign and domestic, because you had a domestic terrorist in the White House, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, if you voted him, if you voted Trump out of office, there'd be hundreds of thousands of people now who would still be alive. Because Trump mishandled the coronavirus pandemic that then tanked the U.S. economy. If you voted him out of office in February 2020, that's basically the second month of coronavirus. Even though Pence is horrible, he was still better than Trump and more. He would, he would have been more responsible in handling coronavirus than Trump. He wouldn't have been spotting a whole bunch of conspiracy theories and all this nonsense that Trump was doing. There'd be there'd be hundred, basically hundreds, hundreds of thousands of people st still alive today if you had done your job. Now, because you didn't do your job and you have half a million people dead, coronavirus, it, 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 you have 18 million people collecting unemployment insurance, some type of pandemic unemployment insurance. OK, yeah, tens of thousands of businesses that are, that are going to tens of thousands of businesses going out of business. I don't even know the exact number now of businesses that have gone out of business. We know 41 percent of African-American owned businesses have gone out of business now because of this catastrophe that you were largely responsible for it getting to this point because you didn't remove Trump from office when you had the chance in February 2020. Now you're saying because of the catastrophe that you helped exacerbate, we should not raise the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour. Um, okay. So this is once again an example of how elections have consequences. But but spineless Lindsey Graham tried to tell uh, Jelinek this is not the time. Now the senator said he wasn't really concerned about large companies like Costco, but he was worried about small business owners. Okay, he was worried about small business owners, though apparently not about workers. Quote: Who is struggling because COVID has reduced their capability to earn a living? Do you understand where I'm coming from? Uh, Jelinek asked. OK, uh, who asked? Uh, uh, Lindsey Graham asked that question, it appears. 
Jelinek responded that he did understand where Lindsey Graham was coming from. Quote, so if you run a restaurant or hotel and nobody can travel in the country and seating capacity has been reduced, the revenues are down. Can you understand why an increased mandate from the government in terms of cost would be a devastating blow? Uh, Lindsey Graham asked. Jelinek replied, I can't understand why it would be a devastating blow. I think it's a devastating blow to employees. He began perhaps to make a point of minimum wage, but Graham spoke over him. The Senate, the senator chided him for not seeing the business hardship of doubling the minimum wage. He said, Lindsey Graham asked, you don't understand. That? And Jelinek responded, I don't know that I was suggesting doubling the minimum wage. When asked by Lindsey Graham if he would support $11 and $11 minimum wage, a proposal put forward by Senator Joe Manchin, spineless Joe Manchin, Democrat from West Virginia, who needs to be voted out of office also. Council CEO Jelinek responded, it's better than $7.25 an hour. Far, uh, 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 fair enough. OK, R read the read the rest of this article here. I want to go to this clip here from Representative Cory Bush, who knows what it's like to be poor, knows what it's like to be homeless, wasn't born with a silver spoon in the mouth. Uh, she, now, she was on uh, All In with Chris Hayes on MSNBC. And she's dealing with uh, the $15 minimum wage. And she says this could be the difference between life and death for some people. Let's go to this clip, Shakita. First, let me start. You're going to have a vote tonight. I think it'll be your it'll be your first um, vote on a major piece of legislation. There's been other legislation, the Equality Act, but this is the biggest thing uh, that you will have to be voting on. How do you how do you feel about that? How do you feel about where things stand? I'm ready to get it done. I mean, you know, we've been sitting and waiting, and I know, you know, all all of these things have to have to happen first. Tonight, we need to get this done. The American people sent us to Congress with a clear mandate, Chris. Do the absolute most we can to provide real relief to everyday people. True COVID-19 relief means raising the minimum wage to at least $15 per hour, no matter what the Senate parliamentarian says. Run us our money. That's what St. Louis and the country deserves. Nothing less. You, I mean, you, you're someone I think you would say, uh, you come from a different background than a lot of the folks you're serving with and from a different place and have different life experiences. And, you know, I, I just from your perspective as someone I think who is closer to being a low wage worker trying to make ends meet with kids than a lot of your colleagues, what, what it would mean for the minimum wage to be raised for those kind of folks? It is the difference between uh, receiving your paycheck after the end of a week or um, or uh, biweekly and having money to pay all the bills or most of the bills versus having money to pay one of the bills and, and then deciding how much food can I buy or do I buy grow, do I buy a medication or can I buy, you know, how, what kind of toilet paper? The thing is, someone has asked one day and said, well, you know, how much, you know, what about buying milk? Like, is that, is, you know, is, I hear there's this thing about buying milk. It's the difference between somebody going, where can I go get the $2.50 milk from or what? Uh, food pantry can I go to to get my basic my basic needs met and then what do I have to go other places to get like this is a real thing it, what about shut off you know I know what it's like to come home every day wondering it will my will there be a, a letter pasted to my door saying 10 days of, you know paying 10 days of vacate will my electricity be off when I make it home will there be a note saying that my gas was turned off you know, if you haven't lived like that, you know, we're, we're talking about $15, Chris. We're not talking about making anybody rich. This is the difference between life and death for people. People do. Look, we're talking about communities also that have lived under decades of disinvestment. They don't care about uh, Senate parliament, parliamentary procedures and a filibuster. They care that they can feed their families. They care that the lights are on and that there is heat, that there is water. They care about those things, and we owe that to the American people. Okay, pause right there. You're in a state, yeah. um, obviously, go, go. Your, your district is heavily done. 
Yeah, go ahead and pause right there. Check that out. Uh, check out the rest of that clip. Uh, All in with Chris Hayes, MSNBC, on February 26, 2021. Rep Bush, Representative Cory Bush, minimum wage hike could be difference between life and death for some. Okay. All right. Uh, I want to go to this uh, next story here. So I, I had talked about this a number of times in the past, dealing with uh, uh, Native Americans and Native American history. And I saw this story from National Public Radio, uh, this story from uh, NPR.org, came out February 25th, 2021. And it uh, deals with the Cherokee Nation, okay? Uh, Cherokee Nation strikes down language that limits citizenship rights by blood. Cherokee Nation strikes down language that limits uh, citizenship uh, by blood. And this ties into uh, history of slavery. This ties into uh, Reconstruction. Uh, all of this, uh, all, all of this history comes together. Uh, I want to pull up this article here. Let me flip over. So I remember back in about 2011 when uh, the Black Freedmen. Uh, was stripped of their citizenship in the Cherokee Nation, and they had to sue to get their citizenship rights back. So if we look at this article here, uh, the Cherokee Nation's, uh, the Ch Cherokee Nation Supreme Court ruled this week to remove the words by blood, B-Y-B-L-L-O-D, B-L-O-O-D, by blood, from its constitution and other legal doctrines. Now, the words added to the Constitution in 2007 have been used to exclude black people or African-Americans whose ancestors were enslaved by the tribe from obtaining full Cherokee Nation citizenship rights, from obtaining full Cherokee Nation citizenship rights. Now, there are currently some 8,500, um, there are currently some 8,500 enrolled Cherokee Nation members descended from, the, from these freedmen, which were uh, 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 thousands of whom were removed on the Trail of Tears, along with tribal citizens. Quote, the freedmen, until this Cherokee uh, Nation Supreme Court ruling, uh, the, the freedmen until this Cherokee Nation Supreme Court ruling, uh, they could not hold office. They could not run for tribal council and they could not run for chief, says uh, Graham Lee Brewer, an editor for Indigenous Affairs at High Country News uh, and K KOSO in Oklahoma. Uh, and I would argue that 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 made them second class citizens. Now, black freedmen in their descent and their descendants have long fought to maintain uh, their citizenship rights, which was stripped from them in, in 2007 with the by blood amendment, the by blood amendment. Now, uh, Monday's ruling, this past Monday's ruling calls those words quote, a relic of painful and ugly racial past, end quote, and draws comparisons to the lingering effects uh, the, the racist Jim Crow laws had on African-Americans. So uh, what exactly is uh, blood quantum, okay? Uh, now, the, the, the decision comes after a federal judge ruled in 2017 that by excluding freedmen from its citizenship rules, the Cherokee Nation violated the Cherokee Nation violated a treaty it signed in 1866 with the U.S. government. The treaty granted citizenship to the formerly enslaved people. This deals with the Black Freedmen Indian Treaties of 1866 that you've heard me talk about so many times before. This then ties into the history of uh, Sarah Rector, 
in uh, Oklahoma among the Creek Indians. Okay, we just talked about Sarah Rector uh, about three weeks ago. All right now, if we look at the, let's see, let's flip over here. I'm going to go to this article on Sarah Rector in just a minute. See, all this history comes together. History and policies and laws, okay? Now, uh, Brewer, who is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation, explains that citizenship rights grant access to services such as tribal health care, scholarships, college scholarships, housing programs, and, and more. For many descendants of freedmen, he notes the Cherokee Nation health care system is their, is their only option for health care. So the discussion about removing them from the citizenship status, it wasn't just a citizenship question. It was a civil rights question. He, he tells uh, all things considered. Now, uh, so check out the uh, check out the rest of this uh, article here. Let's see here. Uh, so they have some excerpts from the interview. What other legal, what other legal implications, what other cultural implications uh, might flow from this change? Now, this really makes it possible that someday a descendant of a freedman, of a black freedman, could be the chief of the Cherokee Nation. It would really illustrate the strength of tribal sovereignty because our citizenship laws are not based on race. They, they are based on community and, and belonging. And so it's much more than just the, quote, amount of Indian blood that runs in your veins, end quote. It's what community do you claim and what community claims you, all right? Um, so those of us that have uh, Cherokee ancestry, uh, we need to look into this and see if we can become members of the Cherokee Nation and, and take advantage of some of these benefits. Now, they talked about the treaties of 1866, and then this ties into Sarah Rector as well. Uh, the Cherokee Nation violated a treaty signed in 1866 with the U.S. government. The treaty granted citizenship to formerly enslaved people. All right, look, we're out of time here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF. Those watching on Facebook and YouTube, keep watching. We're going to keep going for a few more minutes on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network and our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotel. Remember, right now is correct. Wrong behavior is not over till we win. We're kind of forever. Uh, we'll talk to you Sunday night. Peace. Okay, stand by. Uh, let's keep going. Okay, how's everybody doing? Also, if you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Okay, let's go um, uh, quickly because we're going to get out of here. We also have the weekend sale um, the last few days of African American History Month. Get 20% off orders of $100 or more at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, DVD lectures and digital downloads. Use uh, promo code AHN20 off 2021. AHN20 off 2021. We have the promo code uh, on the homepage of our website also. All right. So if we look at this um, article here from FaceToFaceAfrica.com dealing with uh, Sarah Rector. In the article, it mentions the uh, 1866 treaties. And these are treaties with the Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, Cherokee, and Seminole Indians that all owned African slaves. These are known as the Black Freedmen Indian Treaties of 1866. All right, so a few weeks ago, we, we talked about Sarah Rector. She was known as the richest Afro-American uh, uh, girl in the in the in the world or in America. At, in 1913, she was 12 years old. Oil was discovered on land that she got through these Black Freedmen Indian treaties. Okay, uh, and her her parents were born of uh, enslaved Creek Indian ancestry. So 
Uh, Rector, Sarah Rector was born in Indian Territory, March 3rd, 1902. According to sources, she was considered colored, though not African-American. She was African-American. They called her colored. Her parents were owned by Creek Indians before the Civil War. As the site U.S. Slave explains, she and some 600 other black children were entitled to land allotments as children of enslaved people belonging to the Creek Indian Nation. Why is this? In 1866, the Creek Nation signed a treaty with the United States government promising to emancipate their 16,000 African slaves, incorporate them into their nation as citizens entitled to, quote, equal interest in the soil and national funds. This is the same thing the Cherokee did. This, the Cherokee do a treaty like this as well with the, with the U.S. government. Two decades later, the federally imposed Dawes Allotment Act of 1887, D-A-W-E-S, the Dawes Allotment Act of 1887, sparked the beginning of the total assimilation of the Indians of so-called five civilized, five civilized tribes forcing them to live on individually owned lots of land instead of communally as they had done for centuries, the, uh, the site claims. Okay. Uh, but these lands often granted to former slaves were usually worthless, inferior, infertile, and rocky, while fertile lands were reserved for white settlers. In fact, believing that it was worthless, Sarah Rector's father then petitioned the court to sell the land uh, as the family could not pay the $30, the $30 uh, in annual property tax. Okay, So read the rest of this article here from face-to-faceafrica.com from July 13, 2018 by uh, Bridget Boyaki. Uh, Meet Sarah Rector, the 12-year-old who became America's youngest black millionaire in 1913. And that was because of the Black Freedmen Indian Treaties of 1866. That's how her family got the land. All right, now, uh, if we look at this uh, other article here from SmithsonianMag.com, uh, SmithsonianMag.com, the official website of the Smithsonian Institute, this deals with the Trail of Tears. Okay, so usually when we talk about the Trail of Tears, we talk about Thousands of Native Americans being forced to go out west over a thousand miles on the Trail of Tears. They get pushed off their land in southeastern United States because of the Indian Removal Act of, of, of 1830. All right. Now, what we usually are not told is that one third of the people on the Trail of Tears were Africans. OK, because these were. Basically. African people owned by these. uh what are known as the five civilized tribes of Native Americans. How uh, Look at this article from SmithsonianMag.com. Uh, How Native American slaveholders complicate the Trail of Tears narrative. How Native American slaveholders complicate the Trail of Tears narrative. Now, this, is a, this was a, an exhibition at the National Museum of American Indian uh, a National Museum of the American Indian, okay? And this exhibition prompts a deeper dive for historic truths. Now, this is from March 6, 2018, okay? So check out this article as well. Um, all right, and they talk about the uh, African slaves on the, on the Trail of Tears. Okay, now... Lastly, and we're going to deal with this some more on um, Sunday show because I'm tired. It's been a long day, and I did two almost two and a half hours with uh, Roland Martin today on his show, so uh, I'm tired. This last article uh, I posted about this, and I've done a number of stories. We talked about this a number of times on this show, dealing with how uh, Republicans and state legislatures are passing laws to make it harder and restrict what teachers can teach about slavery, racism, injustice, things like this in school, okay? Uh, there's an article from Axios.com from February 24th, 2021. 
states wrestle with how to teach uh, slavery genocide. States wrestle with how to teach slavery and genocide. So states are considering proposals and plans that would exclude or or bolster lessons on slavery and Native American removal in public schools. OK, now, why does this matter? Because I, when I post articles like this, I hear I see some people post things and say, well, we don't have to worry about what other people learn. We just have to worry about ourselves. We just have to teach our children African history. Uh, that means you really don't understand how this works. Because when you go to uh, lawmakers to get policies put in place to address your issues, what they know about you largely influences the policies that they support. And what people know about you largely influences the politicians that they support and the policies they support. This has either a positive impact or negative impact uh, on us. So why does this matter? Conservatives continue to attack the New York Times 1619 project for confronting the U.S. legacy of slavery. Black, Latino and Native American advocates are using the nation's current racial reckoning to push for more diverse history lessons to combat systemic racism. OK, what you know about a people is based upon what you've read, seen or heard about them. And this influences how you treat people. This influences the policies that you support. Now, uh, GOP lawmakers in Iowa, Arkansas, and Mississippi are pursuing legislation that would punish schools for teaching the 1619 Project by withholding funding. Politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth pond resources. So we're going to punish you for teaching because we don't want you teaching about slavery and things like this. We don't want you teaching about racism. So we're going to punish you by withholding funding. Echoing criticism by former President Benedict Donald, the lawmakers say the Pulitzer Prize winning project from Nicole Hannah Jones, the 1619 Project, distorts U.S. history by focusing on slavery instead of the accomplishments of founders and white settlers. This is basically what they're saying. Don't talk about slavery. We don't want you to talk about slavery. Now you're focusing on slavery too much. Even though there are some flaws of the 1619 Project, it's still much better than the 1776 Project that Donald Trump commissioned, but they, but they would rather focus on accomplishments of the founding fathers and, the, and white settlers. Quote, the 1619 project seeks to tear down America, not lift her up. It seeks to divide, not unify. It aims to distort facts, not merely teach them. It does so as leftist political propaganda masquerading as history. Republican Iowa Representative uh, Schuyler Wheeler told the Des Moines uh, Register. The outgoing Trump administration released a response, the 1776 Project, which rejects the idea that slavery was central to America's founding. OK, the, uh, now black Latino educators in Texas and New Mexico have con have uh, convinced their states and school districts to expand classes on African-American and Mexican-American history. The expansion comes after years of resistance. The expansion comes after years of resistance and efforts to block out accomplishments of people of color in history textbooks. A federal judge in 2017 stopped Arizona from enforcing a, 20, a 2010 law that banned a Mexican-American studies program at Tucson schools. Conservatives said mariachi, uh, mariachi lessons and poetry by anti-racist writers in Mexican-American studies classes promoted, quote, the overthrow of the U.S. government, end quote. Um, Y'all do realize that the U.S. went to war with Mexico over land called the Mexican-American War, 1846-1848. You, you do realize this, right? I'm, I'm just that, That's how you got Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, California, Utah, and Nevada. All that came through the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which is what ended the Mexican-American War. 
So, um, see, see, this is what happens when you have crazy ass people in in elected positions. So the backlash against the 1619 project comes amid recent groundbreaking research into slavery and how enslaved people built the U.S. Capitol and many other nations' colleges. So, see, see, once again, now, here's the real reason why they don't want them to teach. The real reason why a lot of Republicans don't want this information taught is because what this does is this strengthens a foundation of an argument for reparations when you deal with the history of what actually happened to African people in this country and how our labor was stolen and how we were subjugated and the laws that were used to do this. So what this does is this really lays a foundation for argument for reparations. So they want to keep people ignorant of history so they can manipulate them. Because when you have a better understanding of history, that gives you a better understanding of policies and laws and how policies and laws shape conditions. Okay, so they talked about the capital, U.S. Capitol, and I have the book here. This book here, uh, Black Men Built the Capital, because I just did a presentation uh, on the 16th for a corporation. And one of the things I was talking about were the skilled trades that uh, African slaves had in this country. So uh, it was African and slave labor that partly built the U.S. Capitol. It was free African Americans. It was uh, African slaves. It, it, and this includes the White House as well. This includes the White House also. It was enslaved African labor and, and free African Americans that built the White House. This is uh, Black Men Built the Capitol, Discovering African American History in and Around Washington, D.C. by Jesse J. Holland. Okay. All right. Okay, so uh, check out the rest of this article here. We'll uh, discuss this some Sunday. States wrestle with how to teach slavery genocide from February 24th, 2021. This is something good to talk about during African American History Month, any time of the year, but especially African American History Month. Visit 4glossygirls.com, that's the number 4glossygirls.com, and follow them on Instagram at 4glossygirls. Digital Dandelion's Technical Solutions works with businesses like yours to create an operations manual for your business, which is something many businesses don't have. According to AARP, more than 30% of small business owners are over 50 years old. Many business owners want to retire by selling their businesses or by passing their businesses on to their children. However, according to Forbes Investment Advisors, many retiring owners attempts to sell their businesses for retirement fail. You cannot sell your business without a business manual. Your children also cannot inherit your business because there is no way to run it. Your business does not have to die when you leave. Their business Bible products will give you the tools you need for a thriving business that can make you money even after you retire. Are you looking at increasing your business's annual revenue? Digital Dandelions can help you make at least $100,000 in annual revenue and expand your business. Speak with them today about solidifying your business. Visit DigitalDandelions.com today and get a free 30-minute consultation. We all know the cannabis industry is headed toward an uprise in the past decade. What happens when there is a brand that brings this uprise in a blow? The cannabis industry welcomes her uprise. Hustle her hemp. Delivering excellence with pride is her watchword. And how you choose to embrace it makes it a priority. 
From cultivating rich cannabis into exquisite and tastefully finished CBD products to delivery, Hustler Hemp leaves no stone unturned. Hustle Her Hemp's mission is to empower women of color by building business and creating legacies, uniting beauty, health, and business. We are a pure definition of how we want the CBD industry to become in the future. While we are redefining innovation, we bring the same energy to improving the quality of life. Hustle Her Hemp is the new Uprise. All right, uh, so I want to remind you that uh, you can still register for our online course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade. They didn't teach you in school. Uh, it's on sale $80 regularly, uh, $130. You can watch from around the world, okay? You can watch from around the world. Uh, we do the classes live Tuesdays, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and all the classes are archived. So you can go back and watch it over and over again. So when you go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, okay, and you scroll down, you'll see the information for our uh, uh, end of the month, uh, Black History Month uh, sale. Get 20% off DVD lectures and digital downloads of $100 or more. Use promo code AHN20 off 2021, okay? And then we have the information for our radio show, uh, the African History Network show. You can click here to listen to audio podcasts of our shows. We have over a thousand audio podcasts uploaded. Click here to read articles that I've written. We have information for the online course here. Click here to register for the online course. Okay. And then uh, click here to enroll. Okay. And as soon as you enroll, uh, you can start watching content. You can watch uh, this past Tuesday's class with uh, Dr. David M. Hotep, author of the book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence. And then the class we did before that with uh, Sister Nubia Wardford, who's a cultural anthropologist, all right? Uh, then also when you scroll down, uh, you see I was on the panel discussion for Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated, Wednesday, February 24th. Uh, let's celebrate Black history. So that was on Zoom. It was a virtual Black History Month celebration. So we shared that on our Facebook fan page also. Uh, then we have the uh, uh, Michael M. Hotep Black History Month 15 DVD bundle pack, okay? and click right here. So you can use the 20% off uh, discount on this bundle pack and uh, other uh, bundles and DVD lectures, digital downloads. Uh, so this includes 15 of my presentations dealing with uh, uh, history, all different topics. You get three lectures I've done dealing with the film Black Panther, uh, Black Panther analysis, African culture, history, and Afrofuturism, because I did a lot of research on the film Black Panther. I read over hundred articles dealing with the film and the movie Black Panther. And I deal, with, I deal with how the film relates to African history, African culture, African language, spiritual systems. I deal with what the word Wakanda means, because Wakanda is a real word as well. It's a, it's a, um, um, it's a Bantu, uh, it's a Bantu word, it's a, in the key Congo language. But Wakanda is also a Native American language, like the Omaha Ponca and Sioux Indian language. It means possesses secret powers, possesses secret powers, which is a lot like black girl magic. Um, but there were 11 different African cultures that were infused into the film Black Panther also. So I, I break down a lot of that information. Uh, that's a almost three hour presentation I did on Black Panther. We have this one here, Breaking the Change, Why We Celebrate African American History Month. And uh, this lecture deals with the uh, real history of African American History Month and Dr. Carter G. Woodson. Uh, the founding of the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, September 9th, 1915. And I, I dispel uh, myths about our history uh, as well. Okay, with uh, with this lecture, this is a three hour, uh, it's about a three hour presentation. I uh, have one dealing with uh, Malcolm X, why is he still relevant? This one here deals with the distortion of the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The revolutionary will not be televised on the television. I deal with the revolutionary Dr. King. The Dr. King that tried to get a concealed pistol license in Montgomery, Alabama in 1956. Dr. King owned guns until Bayard Rustin convinced him to get rid of his guns. Uh, this is another one dealing with Black Panther, lessons from the film Black Panther. How do we take the enthusiasm from the film Black Panther and use it for economic empowerment and political empowerment? Okay, this is lessons from the film Black Panther, economic guerrilla warfare, political self-defense, and uh, how to Wakanda the vote, how to Wakanda the vote. 
All right, so uh, we have that one, and then this one here deals with the Three-Fifths Compromise of 1787, which ended Reconstruction and uh, the history of the Electoral College and how the Electoral College works. Contrary to, so the Three-Fifths Compromise is Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3 of the U.S. Constitution. Contrary to popular belief, it did not say we were three-fifths of a human being. That's a misunderstanding of it. It says for the purpose of representation and taxation, that they would count three-fifths of the population enslaved. Uh, but that, that's trying to determine how many seats in the House of Representatives slaveholding states will um, uh, will have. How many seats in the House of Representatives slaveholding states will have is not saying that we were three-fifths of a human being or anything like that. But also the way the count was taken was corrected by Article 2 of the uh, 14th Amendment of 1868 as well. Uh, this one, the 13 forms of wealth uh, and redistributed paying keys to economic empowerment and entrepreneurship. So this has um, 13 key traits that African-Americans uh, need to have, uh, African-American entrepreneurs need to have. Then I tie all that into history and historical figures. Because uh, I used to teach entrepreneurship. My degree is in business administration. I taught entrepreneurship for seven years. Uh, the racist history of the white national anthem and the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, and I tie all this history in Colin Kaepernick's protests and I deal with uh, the history of the, the National Anthem, history of the Pledge of Allegiance, things like this. Francis Scott Key, who wrote it in 1814 during the War of 1812. This is a double lecture I deal with Dr. David M. Hotel, who wrote the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. Uh, we did this in 2013. So he's dealing with new research from his book, and I'm dealing with uh, great African women in history, the mothers of civilization. We did this here in Detroit. Uh, this is a four-hour presentation. It's a three-DVD set. Redistributing, redistributing the pain, how African-Americans historically fought back against economic boycotts. This is a picture here with uh, one of my teachers, Dr. Claude Anderson. Um, that was a lecture I went to that he did in, I think that was in Baltimore. Brother Jabari in Baltimore did that. But this deals with uh, historic examples of us using different types of economic withdrawal strategies to fight back against uh, white supremacy and racism. Okay, to fight back against white supremacy and racism. Uh, documented examples of different types of economic withdrawal strategies. So that's a hell of a presentation. Um, and these are usually PowerPoint presentations that I'm doing, I have video clips in them, all different types of things. And I deal with redistribute, redirect, and renegotiate. Part of, part of, part of this strategy I talked about on Rolling Show today, um, and when I was talking about uh, engaging in economic boycotts, uh, economic withdrawal strategies, targeting corporations that uh, finance uh, some of these Republican candidates. That deals with um, uh, economic withdrawal strategies, redistrib redistributing the pain that Dr. King talked about April 3rd, 1968, then with economic withdrawal. And then also uh, later in later in Rolling Show, I talked about uh, uh, renegotiating our relationship with corporate America. I think that was later in the show. And I deal with that here, redistribute, redirect, and renegotiate. And this is something Dr. Claude Anderson is, is talked about. I learned some of this from Dr. Claude Anderson. Uh, renegotiate, renegotiating our relationship with corporate America and having funds redirected to our businesses in the form of, uh, in the form of contracts with various corporations. Okay, so uh, we have that one also. That's a hell of a presentation right there, if I say so myself. This one here, the light of ancient Egypt awakes the African uh, African mind economic empowerment. This is during African American History Month. This is a, a really good presentation as well that I did. This deals with the real history, not the fake history that you see on social media memes, but the real history of the Tuskegee experiment of untreated syphilis of Negro male. Okay, uh, contrary to popular belief, they did not inject them with syphilis. They're drawing blood here. They did not inject them with syphilis. There were six hundred men in the study. Uh, 399 uh, of, of the men, of the African-American men, had an early form of syphilis called latent syphilis, L-A-T-E-N-T, -E latent syphilis. And uh, this uh, early form of syphilis has no symptoms. You have syphilis, but you have no symptoms. Uh, there were 201 men in the study that um, had syphilis. There were 201 men in the study that did not have syphilis at all. They were the control group. OK, they did not have syphilis at all. They were the control group. So. Um, yes, they were denied medical treatment, proper medical treatment. 
we know it was a horrible study, but was even worse was just some of the last people are telling about it. Uh, and it's just uh, just nonsense. OK, so th- I deal with the real history of the Tuskegee experiment and how it was exposed. Uh, it ended in 1972, was started about 1932, 33, was supposed to last six to nine months, but it ended up lasting about 40 years. And I deal with a lawsuit that was filed on behalf of the survivors of the Tuskegee experiment as well. This is Great African Women in History Mothers of Civilization. Now, this is a actual, it's actually a two DVD set. So you're going to, you're going to get the um, four hour, ver- four hour version. So two DVD set. So I deal with some well-known and not so well-known African women in our history from all different time periods. Great African women in history, the mothers of civilization. Uh, this one here I did for children, a Black Panther analysis, African culture, history, and Afrofuturism. I was speaking to 60 fifth through 12th graders and their teachers. Did this at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. And um um, I'm showing them how the film Black Panther relates to uh, African history, culture, uh, language, uh, different things like this, and how the teachers can use uh, the film, how they can take the enthusiasm from the film Black Panther and use that to uh, help teach our children their history. Okay. So, a Black Panther analysis uh, for children, African culture, future. African culture, history, and Afrofuturism. And the children liked the presentation. The adults liked it as well. I'm doing a PowerPoint presentation for them. Uh, The teachers liked it. So that was really good. All right. And then uh, this one here, African-American resistance in the era of Donald Trump, voter suppression, reparations, high elections, high consequences. So I deal with uh, three main themes. One, uh, similarities between Richard Nixon becoming president in 1968 and Donald Trump becoming president in um, 2016. And I deal with the uh, how Nixon was a backlash to the Black Power movement and the civil rights movement and the rebellions taking place across the country and how um, Donald Trump was a backlash to two terms of President Barack Obama and the Black Lives Matter movement. And uh, he was the backlash to holding police officers accountable also. That's why he signed the Blue Lives Matter bill into law in 2018. People think that was, for some reason, people that don't do research think that was President Barack Obama. No, it was 2018. Trump was in office. Trump signed that because he ran on that platform in 2016 during the presidential election. And then he ran on that platform again, law and order in 2020 presidential election. But I also deal with the rapid voter suppression that took place in the 2016 uh, presidential election as well, and how there were 868 fewer polling places in the 2016 presidential election as a, as a, a result of the um, lawsuit of Shelby County versus Holder, U.S. Supreme Court case of 2013 that gutted Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, lastly, ancient Kemet, the winter solstice and the history of Christmas. So this deals with the pre-Christian uh winter solstice festivals that are then going to be incorporated into the celebration that we call christmas and all this ties back into ancient egypt ancient kemet and different things like that ancient kemet the winter solstice and the history of christmas okay so this is a 15 dvd black history month bundle pack it's good any time of the year but especially african-american history month it's on sale a uh, hundred dollars but we have the uh 20 percent off um 20% off orders of $100 or more uh, promotion uh, for the end of uh, African American History Month. Use promo code AHN20 off 2021. And uh, we have the information right on the homepage of our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. All right. So, look, uh, we have to get out of here. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now, it's correct for wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you Sunday night. All right. Thanks for tuning in. Peace.
Black Bees products are a collection of natural, organic, personal care products with an appreciation of nature and bees. Our philosophy is without bees, we have nothing. We are honoring our Nile Valley ancestors who understood the importance of bees. Black Bees created a high quality, natural, organic personal care line that would be affordable to everyone. We hope you try and enjoy our Black Bees products line and come back and visit us at blackbeesproducts.com. With blackbusinesstea.com, the messages are clear and meaningful. Keep your business in the black and out of the red. Mind your black business, know your numbers, and plan strategically. Black business boss, lead your industry. Support black business, encourage, patronize, and uplift one another. BlackBusinessTea.com currently has products sold in Detroit, Atlanta, Chicago, and Los Angeles with proceeds returned to the black community. They have a wide selection of hoodies, t-shirts, mugs, hats, sweatshirts that support black owned businesses. Visit the website blackbusinesstea.com. That's blackbusinesstea.com. Soul Natural Beauty Products offers organic, plant-based skin and hair care products that will rejuvenate skin and naturally grow and thicken hair. Their whipped shea butter can heal or restore damaged skin cells to prevent hyperpigmentation and skin breakouts. All products are made with organic plant-based ingredients. Their maximum hair growth oil is fortified with organic herbal extracts and undeniably proves that Mother Nature knows best. It thickens, lengthens, softens, and conditions all types of hair. They even guarantee hair improvement within 90 days or a full refund. Their all-natural 24-hour deodorant leaves the body smelling fresh without sweating for up to 24 hours. It does not stain fabric, goes on smoothly, and has a refreshing lavender and frankincense aroma. It can be used by men, women, and even children. Place your order today at SoulNaturalBeautyProducts.com. That's SoulNaturalBeautyProducts.com. And follow them on Facebook at Soul Natural Beauty Products. Intuitive Design Clothing is an online accessory store that sells one-of-a-kind signature statement pieces for men and women. They also specialize in fashion consultations, closet organization, and decorating small spaces. Are you looking for a statement piece for a special affair or would you like to add some select pieces to your ensemble of accessories? If you're looking for something different, definitely contact Kathy Norman, owner and CEO of Intuitive Design Clothing. Visit their website, intuitivedesignclothing.com. That's intuitivedesignclothing.com. And you can email her at info at intuitivedesignclothing.com. Intuitive Design Clothing is where every entrance is a grand entrance. Yaya Rule is a line of African print inspired apparel catered to black community. The pieces include t-shirts, sweatshirts, hoodies, jackets, dresses, skirts, active wear, bags, and other accessories and home decor. This brand offers a revived way for men and women to wear their black pride and honor their African heritage anywhere at any time. This apparel line is for anyone, whether you are in the corporate world, are an entrepreneur or an artist. Their selection will allow you to casually let your pride shine or dress it up as wanted. It is for those who have already embraced African fabrics and for those who are just getting introduced to them. Reclaim and experience a part of our culture with rich and colorful African prints. The clothing line and the accessories are available right